Well, welcome. Thank you all for, for coming in this afternoon. There are these two generals. I learned an awful lot from them about how to build web APIs. So I'd like to share what I've learned with you. So there are these, uh, uh, these two guys. They're trying to send messages back and forth and keep things uh, in sync between them. And it comes down to the fact that in distributed systems, there are only two problems. Number two, exactly once delivery. Number one, once it only once delivery. And number two, exactly once delivery. <laughs> so, oh, guaranteed order of messages. That ah, ruined the joke. Anyway, you can read it. But, uh, so that's, that is precisely the problem that we are trying to dig into when we talk about these two generals. So, let us take a look at what these two generals are doing. Uh, we've got uh, a city. It's under siege by these two generals camped out on the east and the west. And they have to decide between the two of them, is today the day that we're going to attack, or are we going to wait and attack another day? And the way that they are going to make this decision is that they are going to send messengers uh, east to west, west to east, and uh, try to figure this out. These messengers are going through enemy territory, so they are very likely to be killed or captured. And so, how can we come up with a protocol so that we can send messages and come to an agreement? Because if one of the generals, if one army were to attack, then that attack would surely fail. And then the other army would just have to pack up and go home. It takes a combined attack by both generals in order to win the day. So, what we want to do is guarantee that either both attack or neither attacks. So let's see if we can come up with a protocol that will help us to decide this. So let's suppose that we've got our general in the west who has decided that today is the day to attack. Uh, or I guess I should say tomorrow is the day to attack. Let's spend the day sending messages and then we'll attack in the morning. So he's, he makes that decision. All right, things are, are right. So he sends a messenger. And that messenger carries the message, attack. Now, the problem is that messenger might be killed while trying to send that message. So the general on the west can't know that the message made it through. And so he has to retry. So he sends another message saying to attack. Still, even if that message does make it through to the east, the general on the west doesn't know that it made it through. So he has to keep trying and keep trying, and keep trying. And at no point is he sure that the message made it to the east. So at no point is he sure that he can attack, because he doesn't know if the east general will attack with him. So uh, we clearly cannot attack just based on that protocol. So let's try another protocol. Let's suppose that when the general on the east receives an attack message, then he will send a response. He will say, OK. This way, the journal in the West will know that the response made it through. Problem is, that OK message might be lost, in which case the journal in the West uh, will, will send another one, and then uh, the journal in the East will respond with another OK. And he'll retry. And that one might get through, but the journal in the East doesn't know that it went through. So he can't know that the general on the west will attack, and so he has to keep trying. So clearly, the general on the east can't know to attack. So let's see if we can augment this a little bit more and solve that problem. So the OK makes it to the general on the west. Now let's augment our protocol so that the west general sends an acknowledged response. Problem is, the acknowledged response might get lost, and so he has to retry, and even if it makes through, it makes it through, he doesn't know that the acknowledge made it through, and so he has to keep retrying, and so we clearly cannot attack because the journal on the west has sent an acknowledge. So, how do we do this? How do we solve this two generals problem? 
we solve it by making a couple of simplifying assumptions. So the first of these assumptions is that one journal is going to make a decision and stick with it. So if the journal on the west has decided that tomorrow is the day to attack, he's going to attack no matter what happens with the protocol. So that's different than the original problem. But if we make that simplifying assumption, then things get a little bit easier. The next part is that we want to assume that there is no deadline. So the way that we frame this problem where we're sending the messages on one day and then attacking the next morning, the next morning is a deadline. But if we allow there to be as much time as necessary before that deadline occurs, uh, if we say there is no deadline, time can pass, then we've simplified the problem. And with these two simplifying assumptions, we have uh, reached a problem that we actually can solve. So let's talk about the solution to that problem. We've got a state machine, and we'll be in one of three states. Uh, we will start off in the waiting state. So this is where um, I have not decided to attack, and I'm just simply waiting for a message from the other journal. The attacking state, I have determined I am going to attack. doesn't matter what happens from this point forward, I am going to attack. I'm not sure about what the other journal is going to be doing, however. And so that means now we've got the third state, assured. I'm sorry this is really hard to read, but uh, uh, assured is saying that um, I am determined to attack, and I'm sure that the other is going to attack as well. We've got this state machine, and we are going to follow the state machine using three, uh, or using a set of rules. So the first rule is that we um, start in the waiting state, and then when a general decides to attack, he's going to uh, change to the attacking state immediately. He's made that decision, he's going to attack. And after he's changed to the attacking state, he's going to send the attack message. And he will continue to retry until he receives OK. Now, once you receive OK, you transition to the um, assured state. So now you know that you're going to attack, and you know that the other general is going to attack. So you switch to assured. And at that point, you can stop sending those OK messages, or those uh, attack messages. So what happens on the east? Uh, we're starting in the waiting side. And we've received attack while we're in waiting. And so we need to immediately transition to the attacking state. Uh, in fact, I should have updated these slides. That really should be assured. Because I know that the West General is going to attack, that he's already made that decision. He's going to stick with it, no matter what I do. Um, so I've decided I'm going to attack, so we're assured. And so if we, um, and, and then at that point, we go ahead and send an OK. Now here we don't need to retry. We can just send that OK. Because if we are in the assured state and we receive another attacking message, we can go ahead and send OK. No state change required. I haven't changed my mind about what I'm going to do. I'm just sending another OK. Because I'm assuming, since I saw another attack message, that the West General just hasn't received the, uh, the first response. So those are the rules. So let's play this out, see how this works. So we've got the General on the West has decided now's the time to attack. So let's switch to the attacking state. Um, the General on the West, on the East, is still in the waiting state. So uh, West sends attack. Let's suppose that message gets lost. But he's going to periodically retry, and so he's going to send another attack. When that message gets through, then the general in the east switches to the attacking state, or actually the assured state, and uh, then responds with OK. Now, maybe that message gets lost. But that's OK. We're re retrying the attack. So periodically, we'll send out another attack message. And then when the general on the east receives another attack while he's in the assured state, he's going to go ahead and send an OK. And so that allows the general on the west to transition into the assured state. At this point, no more messages need to flow through the system. Both sides have transitioned into the assured state. We've reached a common state. We've reached consensus. and. Um, 
and uh, we can stop sending the messages. So does anybody recognize uh, this mathematical concept that we just went over? This has a, a name. It's a certain theorem. Anyone familiar with the theorem related to distributed systems? Start with a C. Anyone heard of the CAT theorem? Oh. Yes. So the CAT theorem talks about three different properties. We've got consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Consistency means that two nodes, like the general in the east and the general in the west, are in the same state. They agree on something. So consistency in this case would be they agree to attack. Then we've got availability. Availability means that the, uh, um, the node is going to respond when it receives a message. So if a node goes down in your, in your network, it's no longer available. When it comes back up, it's available. So availability in this case means that there's a general there to receive messages and respond to them. And then we've got partition tolerance. That means that our system will continue to do whatever our system is doing in the face of a network partition. Network partition is just a really nice way of saying that the messenger died. So the CAT theorem is telling us that we can only have two of these things. There's no way to get all three simultaneously. So, we can't be consistent. We both have decided to attack. Available, there's, uh, there's somebody there to uh, receive the messages, and partition tolerant. And we can't, at uh, any given time, know that that's going to be the case. We've made a simplifying assumption that one general is going to decide to attack even before the other one has uh, made that decision, and even before he knows the other one has made that decision. So there is a period of time in which one general will attack and the other one will not. And with that simplifying assumption, then we can solve the problem. But without it, we are demanding consistency, availability, and pressure tolerance all at the same time. And you can't have it. These simplifying assumptions were what allowed us to relax the problem to a point where we weren't demanding all three at the same time. We could give five with just two of those things. And these simplifying assumptions go by another name. So if you, might, if you might have heard of the CAT theorem, you might have heard of a certain kind of consistency, eventual consistency. <clears throat> that is the other name for this, this set of simplifying assumptions. So we will allow for some period of time for different nodes within our system to be inconsistent, to be in a different state. As long as we know that eventually, as long as there's no deadline, time will pass and they will reach a consistent state. In the meantime, one has decided this is my state and other nodes are not there yet. So allow that inconsistency with no deadline, that's eventual consistency. So this is what the two generals are trying to teach us. Let's see how this affects HTTP. So this is, uh, well, in HTTP, we've got, uh, we've got different verbs that we could use. Typically, we stick to four verbs. There's a lot of verbs. I would, argue, I would argue some systems need a lot more than these four verbs. But typically, we use just four verbs. So what are those four verbs? Shout them out. Yeah. What are the four verbs in HTTP that we always use? Uh, get, post, put, and delete. There you go. Get, post, put, and delete. So, so what you get when you walk in late on my yeah, period. Exactly. This is <laughs> but you got it right. Awesome. And so, your question, sir. <laughs> so get, post, put, and delete. Um, what do we typically map these to in a CRUD application? Yeah, we do read. Mm -hmm. oh, if I remember, post is create, put is update, and delete is obvious. Yes. Yeah, so we usually map these to read, update, create, and delete. So we create something on post, and then we can update it on put, uh, give it some new state. Um, some would argue patch is a better use of update because that updates just part of the state, whereas put updates the whole thing. But that's not what this, is, this talk is about, because this is not the way that I want you to think about these rest verbs anymore. I don't want you to map them to read, update, create, and delete. 
Instead, I want you to think about them in terms of safe, idempotent, or no guarantee. So, safe means that when I receive this message, nothing's going to change about my observable state. It's safe to go ahead and send me any messages you want. Nothing's going to happen. Idempotent means that something might happen on the first time, but if you send that same message to me again, then it won't affect the system the second or the third time. So it has one effect and it doesn't change thereafter. But with no guarantee, every time you send me a message, I might change state. So these are the three um, words that uh, I would like you to map to these four verbs. So which of these verbs is safe? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, so idempotent means that the first time I send it to you, you can change state, but thereafter, you can't change state anymore. So which of the verbs are idempotent? Post and delete. We've got post and delete. Actually, it's put and delete. So with post, uh, if you're thinking about post as... Oh, you mean identical message. messages. Okay. Yes, yes, identical messages, oh. yes. Yes, uh, but post, on the other hand, offers no guarantee. I post something at you, and um, you might change state over and over and over again. Let me show you a web application that, a uh, web API as we might typically write it. So here, let's see if I can zoom in on that some more. All right, we get uh, a bit better resolution. So this is a to-do list application. So I've got my to-do items, and I've got my to-do lists. So I can use this, for example, to get a to-do list. Um, so, uh, or this, this one gets all of the to-do lists in my system. Let me go ahead and try that out. So I run that, and I get back this result, where I'm seeing that um, here I've got a list whose ID is 32, the name is household, and here's my href so I can get more items. I've got another one, 36 shopping, 47 workshop. So these are all of the, the to-do lists that I'm keeping track of. And I can use that and uh, I can execute that as many times as I want to. It's not gonna change state. Get is safe. Now, let's suppose I want to create another to-do list. So I'm going to use post in order to create it. So here's my post. Let me create a to-do list that I will call, um, I'll call this conferences. So I want to keep a list of all the conferences I want to go to. So let me go ahead and execute that. And I get back a, I've just created a brand new uh, to-do list called conferences. There we go. So you can see its ID is 51. There's the href for me to get the items for it. But let's suppose that I execute this a second time. Now I've just created another to-do list in my application. I get back at 42. So I've changed the state on the second attempt. And I'll change the state every single time I hit this button. So that's what we mean when we say that post offers no guarantees. So post, uh, post is not being idempotent. Um, it's changing the state every single time we, uh, we make the call. So why is that important? Well, let's see. Idempotency has a mathematical definition. We can talk about it like this. So what we're saying here is x is the initial state of the system. The system is in some state x. Think of x as being a single variable that describes the entire state of the database, everything to be known about the system. And so when we receive a message, then that message, we can think of it as a function f. And so that function will take the state of our system, and it will mutate it so that now we get a brand new system we get a brand new database. Maybe it looks 99.9% .9 just like the original one, but it's a little bit different. But F gives us back a brand new database with just that little change. 
So that's the way that we're thinking about these functions. So item potent says that if I apply f to x, I'll get a new system. If I apply f to that new system, then I'll get that same system again. So f of f of x is the same as f of x. Or thinking about this pictorially, we've got x, which is our initial state. That's going to be our red circle there. And then we apply the function f, and that transforms red to purple. Now, what color do you expect to happen when you apply f again to purple? Purple. You get purple. Because f of f of x is the same color as f of x. So that's being item potent. Now, there's uh, this other thing that I would like to be true that I call strongly item potent. We have a better name for it, but for right now I'll call it strongly item potent. And that is if, uh, if g of f of f of x is equal to f of g of f of x. What does that mean? That if I start here, I apply one function, so I've received one message, then I receive a different message, so I apply a different function, if I receive that first one again, I want to make sure that I'm still in that second state. Let me show you uh, pictorially. So we start at x, we receive f, so we're going to purple, just like we did before. Then we receive g, and we go to lavender. Now, if I were to receive f again, if I'm being strongly idempotent, what color would I want to be? Lavender. Yes, I would still want to be lavender. This looks more like g duplication. Yes, yeah, exactly. That first one is simple deduplication. So if I receive the same message twice in a row, then ignore it the second time. If that second one thing. is a is a little bit more complicated, but still deduplication. It's I want to dedupe f, even if I've received other messages in between. So I want this item potency guarantee, but I want it to be stronger. I want it to um, to reflect the fact that other things might have happened in between. It's a lot more work than the first one. It is. It is a lot more work. But we can get there. So let's see how this second guarantee, um, or, or really how item potency in general, is important to the two generals problem. Is that uh, here I've received attack, so I've transitioned into the attacking, or actually the assured state, and I've done so immediately before sending any response. So that means any time I receive attack from that point forward, I should never go back to waiting. I should never go backwards. I should only be able to go forward. So in this simple case, the only thing that I can do is get to assured. And so that's the, uh, the place I go, and that's the place I stay. So you can think of eventual consistency as being forward only. You can never go back in time. Once you've reached a certain state, you can never go back to some previous state. And that, uh, and that gives you that item potency guarantee. Well, it doesn't necessarily give it to you, but that's a consequence of it. So our first, uh, our first uh, guideline for writing better web APIs based on the two generals is you favor item potent operations. So, um, since we saw that POST offers no guarantee, we've got two options. We can either implement POST to be idempotent. We have that choice. Or we can just use PUT instead. So well, let's, uh, let's see how POST itself is not idempotent. We saw uh, already in Swagger that if we were to POST to a collection, I want to create a new widget in the uh, products collection, then it will add that product and give you back a, uh, a product ID. You send that message a second time, you're going to get 201 created with a new product ID. So post is not being item potent. But it could be if we were to make a change to the way that we implement post. Now remember, it's not that HTTP is making that guarantee for us, but we're writing the server. So we can make that choice. So if we post something that contains the identity, like I want to post a new product, but I'm not just going to call it widget. 
because that's just a name that could change. Instead, I will give it the identity DX12. Whatever that means, I don't know. I just made it. You got you got to have some natural key on the item. Right, exactly. You have to have some natural key. key to recognize that. Yeah. So we go ahead and post that, and then it gives us back 201 created, and here's the URL, products DX12. So if I send that same post with that same identity, I can tell I've already inserted it because I'm using that natural key, and so I just give back to it when created that same URL. So now I've made post item post, and the way that I've done it is I've used that natural key. Indeed, I've used an intrinsic identifier. So some identifier that's intrinsic to the to the object uh, rather than one that's extrinsic. So. What I mean by that is that uh, the um, identifying attributes are carried with that initial message. So rather than saying post and then I get the identifier later from, uh, from the server, I send the identifier with the message. And then on the server side, if it already has that, then it uh, uh, responds in the same way as if it had seen it the first time. It still sends back a 201. There's no action. Takes no action, exactly. And so um, this leads me to, um, to another guideline where we would never expose the internal database IDs of our objects through the API because that internal identifier is one that was generated when you actually did the insert in the database. So it had to be generated on the server. It could not have been carried with the message. So if instead you have to carry the identifier with the message, then the identity of the objects can just be that intrinsic identifier, that natural key. So by not exposing the internal ID, you're not waiting for that round trip. You're not waiting for the server to do something. <coughs> and, uh, and the server can then recognize that it's already seen this message. So what are the things that make a good identifier? We already mentioned one of them natural keys. So what are some other, uh, some other things that we could use as intrinsic identifiers that, um, that we can use to identify an object before we've even talked to our peer about it? Something that's globally unique. Something that's globally unique, like a globally unique identifier. Exactly. Yep, so that's a, that's a pretty strong one. Um, if we are integrating with uh, a third-party system, then that third-party system might provide something that we could use. Yeah, if, you're, if, if the client system is the system of record, then we can provide its ID. Yeah, exactly. So that would give us some external ID that we could use. So any other ideas of things that we might be able to use for... Some kind of hash. Yeah, we can use a hash. Um, now, I didn't put hash on the list. I really should have added that, but uh, I'll give you a public key. Um, so if I, am, uh, if I am representing some identity, like, a, like an end user that has uh, created a key pair, then the public key might represent that, that end user. But it's a crypto thing, so I'll call it a zip code. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, identifier for a color, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and so all of those things are identifiers that are out there in the real world. So those are all very good things. The, uh, the last one that I put up here is a little bit controversial, but I think it's still useful to think about in some cases, a timestamp. So it's possible that you could have two people doing similar things or different things entirely at the same instant in time. So the timestamps might collide. So if you're going to use a timestamp as a, uh, an intrinsic ID, then combine that with something else. So, for example, if um, if we are um, if we're organizing a conference and we've got speakers that are submitting different uh, potential talks to the conference, so the um, the time at which two different speakers let's suppose that we've set up this site, it's like uh, um, it's like. I always blank on the, on the name. I did it on the last video as well. Uh, it's like uh, uh, papercall.io. So you, um, that site supports many different conferences. 
So you might use a good to represent the conferences. And then you've got two speakers from two different parts of the world who are submitting talks to two different conferences, but both at the same time. So there, if you use just the timestamp to indicate the, uh, some unique identity for that request, uh, then you would get a collision. But if you combine the good of the conference and the timestamp of the request, <coughs> then you're much less likely to have a collision. You would have to have two different uh, uh, speakers submitting talks to the same conference at the same time, which is much less likely to happen. If you use timestamp with something that already identifies the user who has made that request, then your chances are even better. So you're pretty sure that one person is not trying to do two, two different things at the same time. So timestamp a little bit controversial, but it's... We have time for a question? Oh yeah, yeah, please. What does using a timestamp gain you? Mm. Yeah, what does using a timestamp gain you? Um, uh, if you have a, uh, um, well, actually in JavaScript, uh, generating a GUID is not natively supported in the browser. Uh, you, you could use a, um, a library to, to generate those. Uh, but, but those libraries, even though they're generating GUIDs, they're, they're not, for example, hitting the, the network card to get the MAC address to get something that's, that's truly unique. Uh -huh. So they are under the covers. Um, really using a timestamp and some other things in order to try Which to get they're not they're not guaranteed either. Yeah, yeah. So okay, um, so, so yeah, if your if your platform's not really capable of anything else, timestamp is a fallback. These are all possible uh, extrinsic identifiers or intrinsic identifiers, but the overall guidance here is to never expose the internal IDs, and instead just use that uh, intrinsic identifier. Let's return to this idea of strongly idempotent. Um, we want to be idempotent even if we've received other messages in between. And as it turns out, put is not strongly idempotent. Put is an idempotent verb, so, um, so we want to favor that as opposed to post, but yet it doesn't have this strong idempotency guarantee. So if I were to put to uh, people, 42, the name Bob, then uh, come back and put to the same uh, resource the name Robert, I might have to replay the first message for some reason. And so <clears throat> once I've done this, then the name is back to Bob. So I've changed state on the second receipt of the same message, just because something happened in between. I mean, for me, this is only a problem if the messages are sequentially important for some reason, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. if, if, if two business events occurred that changed the state and they occurred in the real world in this specific order, but for some reason we got a duplicate mm -hmm. of the first message, then I would want the end result of this system to be wrong <laughs> in this case. But, yes. if, but, if, but if you have three real world events where somebody, you know, Let's say someone gets married and they change their last name yeah. to, from A to B. And they get divorced and they change it from B back to A. Yes. It's just not a problem. Yeah, exactly. So that's the distinction. So between... is that a different, does that mean that we need to send a different message somehow? Precisely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, so that's the distinction between <laughs> uh, messages in a distributed system as kind of a proxy for something that happened in the real world. And so you can replay those messages and those real world things didn't happen again, you're just trying to get the, the message across. So that's the, that's the literal definition of this then, is that that identical message for some reason is replayed. Yes. As opposed to the new event occurring. Exactly. Okay, exactly. that's an important distinction. Perfect, it oh. is a very important distinction, thank you for that. Yeah, and, uh, and so um, actually that, uh, that kind of ties back to what we are saying about timestamps. Uh, if you're talking about a real world event of somebody changing their name, um, that's the sort of thing you wouldn't expect them to change their name twice in the same millisecond. So you might uh, you might um, say that a name change request is identified by the person, the timestamp, and the, the name that they're changing it to. And then some some government document ID is yeah same. yeah just recognized previously. Yeah, so you combine timestamp with a whole bunch of other things, and you get the, a good identifier. Yeah. Excellent.
which also then lets you know once you've seen a whole bunch of these, which is the most recent one. So, put is not strongly item potent. Um, let's try to dive into the math behind this to figure out what's really going on. Why is put not strongly item potent? And so I would like to talk about the commutative property. So how many people know the commutative property of addition? Yes? A plus B equals B plus A. Perfect, yes. So you can add things in either order and you'll get the same answer. Uh, so we want the same to be true about our messages, that you receive those messages in either order and you get the same answer. So if we were to write that in terms of our F's and our G's, then this is what we would expect to see. Uh, G of F of X should be equal to F of G of X. Doesn't matter if you apply F first and then G, or G first and then F, you should get the same answer. Or pictorially speaking, we start at our red X, we apply F to get purple, G gives us lavender, just as we saw before. But now if we start at X and apply G, we'll go off to pink, and then after F, if this property were true, what would we expect to see? Purple. The uh, lavender. Yeah, the lavender. 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 yeah. So the commutative property, if we can say that a, a pair of messages are commutative, then we can say that we can receive one before the other, uh, and it doesn't matter the order in which we receive them. So we can't say that we want the commutative property on all messages, but we can say this particular set should be should commute with one another. It seems obvious that it's a desirable general goal. Mm -hmm. Right? This this really helps you if you're dealing with distributed system. Yes. There, indeed there are is. some things where you have to for some reason write a solution such that, for example, an active passive kind of system where you have mm -hmm. a bunch of subscribers to a message pump that only one is active because the output of one affects the input. Affects the right. Yes. Yeah. But normally this is much simpler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if output affects the input of the next, then commutative is really hard to get. But, uh, um, but yeah, so in general, this is, this is a good thing to have. And if we have the commutative property, and if we have item potency, <coughs> then I can prove that you have strong item potency. So that's actually the name of the thing that we're talking about. So um, given that these operations, F and G, are both idempotent and commutative. I want you to show that the operations F and G are also strongly idempotent. So anyone want to grab a whiteboard marker and come show me the, the proof? No? I'll show you the proof. OK. So, so the proof is, uh, let's start with GFF of X. Right? So we've seen what uh, what color these macros give us. So. Both of these, F and G, are idempotent. That means that I can replay F, and I will still get purple. And then that G gives me from purple to lavender. So because F is idempotent, then G of F of F of X is equal to G of F of X. All right. Now, these operations are also commutative. So if I were to commute F and G, then that should get me to um, yep, F, uh, yeah, G of F of X, we already saw from up here, gets us, gets us to lambda. And then because these are commutative, then swapping these two should give me the same color. So this should result in lavender. So in other words, I could say that F of G of F of X is equal to G of f of f of x. But if you were to put g first, then you could have a you could have different transitional states, but not a different end state. Precisely, yes. Yeah, you put g first. Uh, like in the in the previous one, we saw g takes red to pink, but then once we've applied the f, we have to get back to lavender. Yep. So different transitional states, but the same final state. This statement, however, is. The, uh, the same as the strong item potency, because f of g of f of x is equal to this, which we've seen is equal to g of f of x. And that is what we wrote before with the strong item potency. 
that even if something has happened in between, F is still being idempotent. So that combination of just regular idempotency and commutative, commutivity, those two properties <coughs> give us this strong idempotency. So it is a de desirable thing for us to have both of them at the same time. So now we can say something a bit more mathematically precise than put is not strongly idempotent. We can say that put is not commutative. That's the reason that it didn't work the first time. In fact, we can say something stronger than, uh, than this because we've made an assumption here about put that put is doing an update. So it's not really that put is not commutative, it's really that update is not commutative. So that's the real problem. So what I'd like to do is favor commutative operations. So this is my third piece of advice from the talk. So you should be able to accept puts in any order, which means that put can't simply be an update. Put has to be something a little bit different. Let's take this example and switch it around. So now my puts are something different. And while we're at it, we're going to get rid of these posts. OK, so this was our API before. We had posts. We had uh, puts that were uh, mapped to updates. And so this is the API after. Post is gone. And we are using puts to represent either the, uh, the creation or the update of an entity. So it's representing something different. Let's, let's stick with the, uh, the simpler of the two, the to-do list itself. Um, and so just as before, we can get all the to-do lists and try that out, execute that, and we see a whole bunch of to-do lists. Here's my household, shopping, etc. So if I were to put this version of the API is taking that identity, that um, extra or that intrinsic identifier. So some identifier that, uh, that I make up on the client that means that thing. So since I'm making this up on the client, I might use a good, I might use a hash. I, uh, um, uh, if I, if I'm uh, yeah, daring enough, I might use the, the timestamp. Um, let's just go ahead and use uh, 67890. So the client has generated that in such a way that it's, uh, uh, that it's certain that it's unique. And so when I execute that, then I get back a 201 that this has been created and so there is the, um, the URL of that, of that to-do list. So unfortunately, I just uh, passed in the name of string. Ah, I didn't mean for it to be string. So let me change that. This should have been my conferences. But now I'm about to execute the very same put. So I'm using the same put endpoint. So I'll execute that. And now I've got 200. OK, I have just gone and updated that, uh, um, that object. Now the, uh, the name. Uh, OK, there's apparently a bug in there. Oh, OK. All right, this thing right here. The, uh, the update date time, that's what I forgot to do. Um, so let's read the time from the clock and let's say that this is, you know, a few milliseconds have passed. Now let's execute that. And here's my 200. Okay, the name is now conferences. Same URL, so it's the same thing. 6890 is still the identifier of this thing. So, um, so I have, um, I've received my put and I've changed the state of my, uh, of my object. 
if I were to go back. So, so you're using, in this case, you're, you're literally using the timestamp to deduplicate your message? Yes, yeah, I'm using the timestamp to, de to deduplicate the message. So if at some point in the future I receive the message from the past, so that was 53 and some seconds, uh, and this message in the past, instead of calling its conferences, I just had this in a string. I execute that. The state is still conferences. So I haven't gone back in time to the <laughs> previous version just because I replayed an old message. So this version of put is both idempotent and commutative. And I'm using this both to change the state of an existing resource and to create new resources. And I can do that because I'm providing the identifier from the client. It's intrinsic to the object that I'm updating. So in all of these cases, your implementation is, is specific to your solution. Uh, there, yep. There's nothing specific about any web API spec or the, or the verb, the, the HTTP verb spec that, that says you're going to do any of this. Yeah, right, correct, correct. So we're just yeah. making decisions here. Yeah, yeah, we're just making decisions about how we're going to implement our web APIs. So that's what we want to do is favor those commutative operations. One way in which we can favor commutative operations is by using immutability. So um, what we saw in this example was just simply <coughs> all it was doing is checking the timestamp, and if it had already received a newer message, it ignored the, uh, the older message. So it was a really simple example of how to get commutative uh, post, or I'm sorry, commutative put operations. But a uh, um, a, a more rigorous way of getting that same guarantee is to make sure that all of your state is immutable. And so what that means is every time you receive a message, you either insert something or do nothing. So if you haven't received it yet, you insert it. If you already have, then you do nothing and you pretend that this is the first time you've seen it. So this guarantees the commutative property because um, if your objects are immutable, when you receive a message the second time, you see that you already have it, you're not gonna change that message. You're just going to recognize it by its intrinsic identity and then respond as if it were the first time. It gives you that commutative property. Um, it also uh, aligns the data storage with the messages themselves. And I really love this property because you receive a message that has all of this data in it what you can do is just simply represent that as an object in your data store and store it. And now you can very easily see if you've received the same message. You just look it up by that data that's already in it, see if it's already there. And you don't have to take your messages and then transform them into some business objects and then read that state of the business object, translate it, and save it back. Um, you just simply take your messages and you, and you store them. It also solves the cache invalidation problem. Because if things are immutable, then your cache of the thing is never invalid. Now, you might have new things, you might have new information that you want to also cache. So your cache moves forward, but now it's moving forward in exactly the same way as your system. You're posting that new information to it and you're accumulating it. So it assumes that your cache is immutable as well as your underlying right. data store. Yes, it assumes your cache is immutable too. Yes. So you just kind of think about your, your system in terms of these immutable objects. Um, now, if you've got immutable objects, you could say that all fields in that object participate in its identity. There's nothing that you could change about that object uh, because it's immutable. And so if you, um, like for example, a, a conference talk. So we, we choose the, the identifier for that conference talk, but we can't put the name in there because the name is not immutable. I might come back later and change the name of my talk. So that means that naming a talk has to be another message. This message that is the talk itself can only contain the things that uniquely identify the talk. So 
all the fields in that message participate in the identity of the message. Which means now you can hash that message and you can check to see if you've already got it. It uh, really simplifies things. So to go a bit more into detail about, um, about the, uh, the patterns that we just talked about here and how to uh, implement them within a database, you can see last year's talk on how not to destroy data. I've got a recording of that on historicalmodeling.com right there. And this talk uh, will also go up on historicalmodeling.com so you can watch both of those back to back. So in order for us to create better web APIs, favor idempotent operations, never expose your internal IDs, use intrinsic IDs instead, and favor commutative operations. All right. Thank you very much.